Well, good morning. Good morning. How are y'all doing this beautiful day? I think I'm doing well, too, and I'm grateful for that. A um, couple of announcements. Uh, birthdays this week. Eleanor Troy is on September 1st. Uh, I believe that's the only birthday and anniversary I know about. Am I missing anybody? All right. Some announcements in your bulletin. Uh, today is family worship, so all the little ones are going to be staying in here with us. Um, so there are worship bulletins uh, on the table up front. Uh, Ms. Michelle has completed a list of ways that we can assist Waverly Nazarene in the campgrounds with the flood relief. And that list is at flychurch.org. And they are planning on taking up an offering on September 5th. Uh, for the Waverly Nazarene Church and October 3rd for Camp Gardner Creek. Youth night! We are going to try the balloon thing one more time. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to just throw them at somebody anyway. Just because. I'll give you one to throw back, I promise. Oh, if you didn't get to see, our t-shirts are available to order. They look nice. And is there a picture of them in there? Okay. Uh, so on the front table, you'll see a picture of those. And they would like you to submit uh, your order by September 26th. Next Sunday is the first Sunday, so that's a potluck dinner. Let's see, I think that's about it. Any other announcements that I'm forgetting this morning? Well, in case you're wondering, I'll make sure I get it right. Brother James and Miss Michelle are at St. Peter's. Yes. And... Uh, their goddaughter is being dedicated today, so um, we we're missing them. I'm glad they get to go enjoy that. Just to give you a heads up of where they are. If you will, get your songbook and turn to page 379 and stand as we have our call to worship. 379. Three hundred and seventy-nine. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangle me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple-hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Be at rest once more, O oh my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, O oh Lord, have delivered my soul from death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, I want to thank you for a chance to come and gather and worship you, to study your word and to grow and be more like you. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be in the midst of this service and all your services around the world. Lord, may your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mike's wearing every hat today, y'all, so give him some love at the end. We're going to start with page 468. 468 I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus 
134. Scripture says we love because he first loved us. 134. <clears throat> kids at school all the time. I never mess up. That was my first time. Um, they don't believe me because they saw yesterday I did it too. I have neglected to ask for some ushers. I'm not pointing anybody out, but thank you. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for the gifts that you bestow upon us. Lord, and as we give back, we ask you to uh, bless this offering, the giver. And Lord, we ask you to give us wisdom of how to use your finances to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
As I said, Miss Michelle is gone, and this is our last Sunday of the month. So, young ones, you're staying in here with us. But that's awesome because since we're going to turn around and greet one another, I love it because I can actually see them. Except them, I love to see them excited, going, "Hey, hey!" So everybody, turn around to them and go, "Good morning." And greet one another in the Lord. <laughs> I try to wave at them sometimes, but I don't know if they notice as they run by <laughs> on the way out. But I tell you what, I love the excitement that they have. All right. Uh, prayer request today. Yes, ma'am. For all the flood. Yes, ma'am. That's what I was thinking. Here we go. So, um, remember them. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. For all those with COVID and to slow and stop the spread. So. Mm -hmm. Any other? Travel mercies. <laughs> Absolutely. Any others? Let's pray for our school. We have, we're short staffed and then we have lots of sickness. Mm -hmm. and just need, need lots of prayer. Amen. Amen. It's stressful enough without having to worry about the other things. So um, definitely pray for your schools. Um, pray for the leadership. Pray for the students and everything that goes on. Yes, ma'am. Um, this year, prayers. I'm taking the kids skating, so prayers for safety there and back. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And while you're there. <laughs> Amen. Mike, we need to remember all the Afghanis and all the folks still over there. It's heavy on my heart. Yes. Amen. Any others? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we just want to thank you for today. Lord, we want to thank you that we actually have a chance to come to you. And not only thank you for the good stuff that you have done, but to lay our burdens and our requests at your feet. Lord, we think about all the ones that are impacted by the flood and with the current storm coming, those that may will be impacted. Lord, we ask you to continue to be with the families. Continue to stir the hearts of those that are moving to help. Lord, be in the midst and open the doors to help them and see them through this time. Lord, for those that are sick with COVID, our loved ones, Lord, first we ask for protection. We also ask for those that have this COVID that you would see them through. That you would lay your healing hand on them and help them mend and get stronger. And Lord, for that, we just ask for protection. Lord, we know uh, this week and uh, we have some traveling. I know next weekend we'll have some traveling. We just ask for traveling mercies that you would lay your hand of protection over those that are moving to and fro. Give them a good, safe time while they're there and see them safely home. Lord, for those that have lost loved ones, we ask that you would be with them, touch them, send people their way that would help, help share the burden and love them with your love. Lord, for Afghanistan, Lord, we just ask you to be in the midst of the turmoil that is there. Lord, to lay your hand of protection on them. From a human standpoint, it's hard to see all the things that we're praying about, but from your standpoint, we know you see clearly. and We just lay these in your hands. And we just ask you to move, to touch, to protect and to see your people through. Lord, right now we ask you to be with Brother James and Miss Michelle and the service they're in. Lord, that it would be a good time. 
Lord, we want to thank you for them and what they mean to us. And just let them enjoy this day and be refreshed. Heavenly Father, as, as we turn into your word, we ask you to open our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. If you'd like to get your Bible, you can turn to page, uh, if it's a pew Bible, it's going to be page uh, 719. We're actually going to be out of the third chapter of Daniel. The third chapter of Daniel. This has kind of been on my mind for a while. So with the events of everything that's going on, I thought it seemed quite fitting. Uh, so again, if you got a pew Bible, that's 719. Um, and uh, if not, um, Daniel chapter 3. So if you find my glasses in the yard outside, I might want those. Somebody already said, well, would you like to borrow mine? And no, I don't want to support y'all's up here. They might work, they might not. And uh, I, I'm good. So if you see me squinting or stumbling over something, just know I'm going right there. I finally reached that age where I finally understand this. I dread the next part, which is what I heard is my arm's not long enough. <laughs> but actually, I can't see that out there either. I'm in trouble either way. <laughs> so Daniel's chapter, Daniel chapter 3. So King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and width was 6 cubits. He set it up on the plains of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps and the prefects, prefects excuse me, governors and the counselors and treasurers and the justices and the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces to assemble to come to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps and the prefects and prefects, excuse me, governors and the counselors and treasurers and the justices and magistrates and all the officials of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O people, nations and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, Tigan, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall and worship shall be immediately thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as the people heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, tigan, um, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, all the peoples and nations and language fell down and worshipped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, tigan, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a, fire, a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews among you who have appointed, excuse me, who you have appointed over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These pay you no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, tigan, harp, drums, and entire musical ensemble, to fall down and worship the statue that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, 
O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hands, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them in the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics and their trousers and their hats and their other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. And he said, he said to his counselors, Was there not three men that were, that were bound into the fire? Excuse me. There are three men that we threw bound into the fire. They answered the king, O oh, true, O king. He replied, But I see four men unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of the blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps and prefects and governors and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their head was not singed, their tunics were not harmed, not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I will make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that utters blaspheme against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruin. For there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Heavenly Father, again, as we look into your word, open our hearts and minds for what you have for us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Talk about a bad day at work. You go to work, you're doing your thing, your boss calls you to the office and goes, this is what's going to happen, or you're going to be fired. Now, this is just a little above and beyond. This is what's going to be happening, or we're going to throw you into the fire. And, of course, what do they have to say? We're not going to do it. And as I think about this, I think about the fiery trials that they had to face. They faced for their faith. But also get to thinking about the fiery trials we have to go through. The trials we go through in life. And it might be, it might be something that feels like it's a fiery trial. It might be the floods that have come. It might be the sickness. It might be a form of persecution. It might be something that we're fighting with on an emotional or mental side. Something in our life that is a battle and is a fiery trial against us. And as I think about that... I think about a few things I'd like to point out in this. Um, she said it was really sad. We were talking last night, and I was telling her about her scripture today, and she goes, oh, I love me some Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Love it, because these guys, if I could have their faith, I, I hope if there's ever a time that my faith is put to this level of a test, that I will be able to stand and, and say, yes, I will serve my God no matter what. But one of the things they said that I love is they have no need to defend their faith. In verse 16, it says, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to defend, to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, oh, let him deliver us. 
But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods. You know, as a Christian, sometimes we get asked why. And I remember as a younger Christian, I accepted Jesus as a young adult about right after I'd gotten married. Um, and we were married in 94 and I accepted Jesus in 95. So I got to grow and watch, I mean, some very lifelong saints and watch their, their faith. And there were many times that I stood there and it was like, oh, I, I don't believe it. Then I figured out, I shouldn't say that. I should say, because God can do all things. So it shouldn't be, I don't believe it. It should be more turned into, that's God doing his thing. Because I believe he can. I love to watch it when he does. But, you know, when I watch them, I'd look at them and go, how could you be so calm with this going on? And this is what I'd be in, in my mind. I wouldn't come to them and go, how are you doing that? How are you facing this illness? Or how are you facing this? And their whole being was, I'm trusting in God. They didn't need to give me a defense for that. I, I, now, we might be challenged by that sometimes where people go, how are you doing that? Well, I'm trusting in God. And they're like, well, how can you do that? I think the best answer if someone says, how can you trust God with this? The answer should be, how can you not? How can you not? From a human standpoint, if there's a trial and tribulation going on in my life, Mike can do everything he can do. I can call all my friends alongside me to help all they can. As a Christian, Mike can still try to do all he can do. And Mike can still call all his friends to help. But first and foremost, I know I have a God that loves me and that he is in the midst of that battle. And the first layer is, God, I'm giving this to you and I'm trusting you. And to be able to say, God, I'm trusting you with this, from a human standpoint, it, it's troublesome to go, this is all I've got and this is all. But to, to be able to lay that down at the feet of Jesus and say, it's yours. You move. You bless, you touch, and just let me stay faithful and follow along. I don't need a defense for that. Like I said, if somebody wants to say, how can you believe? How can you not put your trust? You know what makes me really mad at myself when I say that? Sometimes when I'm fighting against things, what should be my first instinct is, all right, God, here we go. <laughs> Two, three days later, I go, okay, God, come on. <laughs> Instead of the very first here it is. My first instinct should be, here it is. And to know that I can trust God, but God might not always do what I want him to do. I'm going to actually pull this. I was reading, one of the things I was reading this in so many different versions this week. Um, and uh, I'm going to read this one out of actually NIV. Both, both are that right there saying the same thing, but I love the way this is phrased. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us. And he will rescue us from your hand. O king, but if he does not, we want you to know that we will still not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. To know that when we give it to God and we hand it over to him, that he can is a great peace. But to also know that sometimes he doesn't move in the direction I want him to go. And that's okay too. I have watched people over the years that I've prayed with. I have went to visit people that one man's come to mind, had cancer. They had him opened up. But they left him opened up because they had to go in and keep working and doing. And he shouldn't be here today. And he is. Though I know another friend that just recently um, we were praying same thing for her healing. God that can heal one can heal the other. And she was asking me, she said, um, why? I've lived a good life. I've lived a good, clean life. My siblings have not. And now I'm riddled with this. You know, sometimes when we're going through those trials and those fires, those questions do come up. Why? And that's okay. Jesus asked why. Why have you forsaken me? If he can ask why, then so can I. 
I think Brother James said at one time, if you need to go outside and talk to God in your backyard and have a good, all right, God, I have no idea what's going on, and I'm upset, and I'm, as Brother James said, at least you're still talking to him. And God can do something with that. And in that, I told her, I said, you know, I don't know. I don't know why God that can do all moves here. And I won't say doesn't move here. And why I say that is because God is moving and doing his thing at all times. From the human standpoint, it might not look like he's done anything. But then the question I have to ask is, how bad would it have been if he hadn't have moved? And if I could put on my God spectacles and see things as he sees them, I only see them from my standpoint, my little human standpoint. If I could look down and I could see it from God's standpoint, and I could see the overall picture, it would make more sense. And the only thing I told her, I said, here's all I can say. If this cancer takes you, you're ready to meet God. Your siblings aren't. On that note, or at least some of them were not, watching you and your walk through this time will speak volumes to them. And how might that draw them to God? So sometimes what looks like God is not moving is actually God doing his thing when you step back and look at it from his perspective. I had a girl a long time ago in my youth group. She was in an accident. Bad accident. And uh, a little while later, her friend had an accident. A different type of accident, but still. She made it. He didn't. And we were having that conversation one night. She goes, God can have saved us both why i said i don't know why i don't i don't have the god vision i don't see the big picture but here's what i know he was ready to meet god if you had died that night would you have been and she said no i said then that's probably why god said she needs a little bit more time strong christian lady today so when we look at it we realize that we put our faith in god and we say just as they said god can but even if he doesn't i'm not going to give up on god because god doesn't give up on me he'll never leave me or forsake me so if it's if he does great and if he doesn't i'm trusting him that there's a better greater reason why that i don't even understand and probably will never understand but i'm trusting him through it all and through that i get to thinking about i'm not alone because here these guys were, they were taken, they were thrown into the fire, the guards that threw them in, it was so hot and wild, they died. And can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar looking in going, wait a minute. First of all, why are they moving? They should be dead. Why are they moving? And then he's going, there's movement. There's four of them. Did one of, the guards, did one of the guards fall in? I mean, what's going on here? Oh no, three went in, and this is what I think is interesting. Three came out. But in the midst of the fire, there were four. And as he put it, and the fourth has the appearance of a god. See, <laughs> of course, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's like making a standoff here with God, so it doesn't surprise me that there was something of this magnitude and this power. But the fact is, when they went through their trial and they were thrown in, I don't know how it was. I don't know if when they were walking up, they were going, well, this isn't that hot, or if they actually felt it. I don't know how God took care of that. I know the guards felt it. And as they were thrown in, can you imagine walking around a fire and your, your binds coming unloose and you're looking around and there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and my God, right there with me. What that must have been like. His protective hand. So when we're going through our fires of life and these trials that come upon us and we might feel like that we're alone. We're never alone. God's right there with us, right there with us in the midst. And I can't think of anything, any of y'all have ever had a loved one go off to surgery, you kind of have this feeling. My grandfather, when my grandmother was going to have the surgery, of course, we went there and we was praying with her. And, and he started, he goes, I just, he's the sweetest man. If I could be half as, half as awesome as he is, I'd be living good. And I'll tell you this, I probably shouldn't. There was one time at church. He, he wrote on his books, and I've been looking around. You're the prettiest one here. And she said, you need to be listening to the sermon. 
but it still made her smile. So he got down, he got her by the hand, he said, I just want you to know, you, you've been a wonderful wife, and I love you, and God's going to see you through this, and we had to send her off. Because, you know, as a family, you can only go so far, then you got to watch them go. In that trial, God went with her. I think about that a lot when I think of Ethan when he had his little hernia surgery. Man, he's a little old baby. He had on them little scrub things they put him on. It would have been cute if he wasn't about to have his little hernia surgery. Where Stephanie and I were trying to be, you know, smiles and happy, happy, because he's about to be rolled off. And I'll never forget that nurse grabbing hold of that, that little bed to roll him off. And I thought, because uh, everything inside of me wanted to go, well, no, you don't, but I knew he had to. And we'd gone as far as we could. Loved him, prayed for him. And so my thought as we're watching him roll off is, God's walking with you. And God, I need you to go in there with the surgery room. I need you to oversee and take care. I need you to protect. I need you to enhance the gifts of the doctors that you've gifted them with. I need you to give them wisdom. If there's something they need to see, Lord, make sure. I need you to be chief surgeon. Because I couldn't go. God's there. In the midst of our trials, God's there. And lastly, when we do this, when we're going through our trials and we have surrendered them to God, and we're going to accept, because believe me, when Jesus was in the garden and he was saying, Lord, if this cup can pass from me, let it pass, but not my will. And we can pray in that way, Lord, not my will. This is what I want, and you have the power. This is what I really want, God. But not my will, your be done. When we can live that way, and we can walk through these trials and realize, even when I feel like I'm at the, I'm, nobody cares, and nobody's with me, and nobody loves me, God's right there with me. And the scripture says he'll never leave me or forsake me. When we walk that faith, it's going to be like when I was a fresh Christian watching these saints live a life before me. When I scratched my head and went, how, how are they walking this way? How are they putting such trust? And guess what it did to my faith? It helped strengthen. As a non-Christian, it would help people look at them and go, there's something peculiar about this and maybe help draw them to God. Stephanie's got a Bible at home and uh, she said if the house is burning down other than anything important papers to grab her Bible. And we were looking at it last night because ever since we started walking our faith together, she had this Bible and she has wrote, some of y'all might have done this, she has so many notes and cards and stuff stuck in here, so-and-so preached this, so-and-so passed away here. So-and-so gave me, it's full. But we were looking through some of the cards of some of the ones that have gone on um, that have loved us, that have been that model. And what that has done, just like we saw in this, Nebuchadnezzar had a change of mind, a change of heart. If we can live that way, we can help people have a change of mind and a change of heart. Maybe it's those fresh Christians that need to be able to see, oh, that's what deep faith is. That's what it really means to get a hold and don't turn loose. Maybe it might be those people that are struggling going, I can't do it anymore. Then they notice, how are they doing that? How are they putting that much trust? Because my God says he'll never leave me or forsake me, and he's with me through it all, thick and thin, mountaintops, valleys below. Maybe it's those people that are watching us day in and day out and going, maybe I should be a Christian. I mean, look at that. If I was going through what they were going through, could I, have, could I live that way? Doesn't mean I'm bounding through my trials going, yippee! No. I doubt Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, so go ahead and tie me up. It's all good. They weren't sure of their outcome but they knew where their trust was in God, and they knew he was able. So just some thoughts as we think about the trials that we have seen, the wars, the tragedies, 
the different events to hold to our faith and to truly believe in the one that's got us in the palm of his hand. You know, Jesus paid far too big of a price to say that he doesn't love us and he doesn't want our best. I like to think of it like this. I heard somebody say, God didn't die for junk. He died for the treasures of his heart. And you might view yourself as, well, I'm not worthy of that. God's got some work to do on all of us. There's a story of, um, it's talking about a, we'll try to get this right. There was a dad that had given a vehicle uh, to the child and said, here's your vehicle. Why won't you go down to the car lot and see if they'll trade it in for it? They went in and they said, they wouldn't give me much for it. It's an old beat up car. Mm, okay. Well, let's try a different place. You know, let's go over here. They wouldn't give him something else either. He goes, tell you what, there's an antique car show down the road this weekend. Go ask them how much it's worth. And he went. He came back and he said, you would not believe how much they say. This is a true antique. And they said it can be restored and built back up and its value is beyond measure. Sometimes the world looks at us and goes, hmm. I junk. But when God looks at me, he don't see that. He sees a treasure that can be fixed up. Something, somebody who's worth more to him than words can describe. And I thank him for that. And as we turn our mind and our thought to our communion this morning, I want you all to remember that. That the Lord who died for you said he'll never leave you or forsake you. That he sees the extreme value in you and loves you beyond measure. Even at times when I don't see it myself. As I think of that price, I think about the communion supper. Instituted by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a sacrament which proclaims his life, his suffering, his sacrificial death and resurrection. And the hope of his coming again. It shows forth the Lord's death until his return. The supper is a means of grace. In which Christ is present by the Spirit. It is to be received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. For those who have truly repented, forsaking their sins and believing in Christ for salvation, are invited to participate in the death and resurrection of Christ, we come to this table that we may be renewed in life and salvation and be made one in his spirit. In unity with the church, we confess our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for all that you've done. Lord, we want to thank you that you are with us through the thick and the thin. Lord, that you have laid down your life for us. That you have raised from the dead and you have prepared a place for us so we can be forever with you. Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless these elements as we receive them. Lord, they can minister to us and help us to remember all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. I've asked those that would come and help to pass out our animals.
the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and be thankful. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and be thankful. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for this day. Lord, and we ask you to uh, bless us as we prepare to dismiss. Lord, we don't know what the day has in store or the week. Lord, we just place this in your hands. Lord, help us to remember that as we journey through life and the trials come upon us, that you are with us and you will see us through. Lord, help us to live that life of faith, to put that trust in you and to help others come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. And you're dismissed.